I drove up to Michigan to the suburbs of Detroit to meet my buddy Shane and see the project he's been working on. He says it will be well worth the drive, so I'm looking forward to it. Let's see what he's got. So here we are. Finally made it to my buddy Shane's place. Camry four-cylinder, Scion TC engine as well, in a BRZ FRS chassis. Man, I don't know who thought of that mod other than my buddy here, but it works, man. Fits surprisingly well, and you can even use a stock Scion TC ECU. Who would have thought? Can't wait to give this a ride and hear all about the amazing kit my buddy has put together here, and hopefully I'll own one someday, so... Stay tuned. So Shane, tell us what inspired you to do this build and uh, tell me how it all works. Well, what inspired me was, um, well, like everyone, I blew up the FA-20. Uh, it happened just on one quarter mile pass, so that was very disappointing. And oh, I got man. a lot of experience with the Toyota 2AZ FE, so I figured, you know what, let me just go back to my roots. It's Nobody's really doing anything that's notable with this motor, mm -hmm. but... I have been, and uh, I've been helping a lot with the Scion community, just trying to keep it alive. So, yeah, uh, I've been running this motor since 2018. Uh, and uh, this particular one is built bottom end, forced internals, Brian Crower stage shoe turbo cams, 11 in one compression pistons. Um, I'm running a turbo from an Evo 10 wow. and custom exhaust manifold. Uh, and as far as a lot of the other parts that's in here, I kind of designed stuff to make it work with the, um, this platform without having to molest the body whatsoever. So there's no, there's no welding or fabricating of the body or anything to make this work. Everything for the most part is bolt on and plug and play. The only one off part that's kind of necessary is the hood. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I could get the motor to sit lower, but then I would have to screw with messing with the sheet metal and all that stuff and probably run a different transmission. So that pretty much raises production costs doing all that stuff. Right. I wanted to keep it as cost effective as possible. And I built a few cars for other people like this. I have a kit that's uh, made to order and uh, the price is uh, relatively low. So it's like uh, under 10K for the most part. That's fantastic. So the other question is, how's the oil burn on these engines? I know they're not really made for performance, but uh -huh. it's more for convenience in this mod, but is that really a problem? Uh, that's only a problem if you neglect the motor for the most part. I mean, there, there was like a, a technical service bulletin that was put out way back when about it. Uh, that was largely due to uh, piston design um, and also people just blowing well past their oil change intervals because, you know, Toyota are reliable, you know. People think that they won't break down no matter what they do until they do. Hmm. The good news is um, a lot of those people would have a lot of blow by and they would still be able to drive their motor to the dealer to get it serviced. Whereas with the FA20, once you spin a bearing, that's it. Done deal on that, that's for sure. Right. So it sounds like the pistons are the main issue, but if you have a forged bottom end, you should be clear of that issue. Yeah, for the most part, um, they, they did make a few changes that made the motor a little similar to the 2JZ. Um, with the 2007 and up motors for the 2AZ FE, there are oiler jets underneath the pistons and the, um, the uh, headsets are a little shorter. So for the most part, with about $2,000 worth of internals, um, uh, main studs, head studs, uh, rods and pistons, you could have a bottom end that will support 400 horsepower with no problem. And what about that stroker kit? I don't know if they make them anymore, but I've seen a few still left in stock. Will the, stir the, uh, the stroker kit work with this build that you do here for the rear wheel drive application? I believe it could. Um, of course, when you're uh, raising compression, you have to adjust for a lot of other things and tuning is everything. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of people ask me, you know, why are you running such high compression pistons? Well. I like to take risks. I mean, mo most of the time people run 91 compression, which, you know, depending on who you ask, that's still high, but that's like the native compression of this motor for the most part, and it still handles boost well. That's fantastic. So another thing, as you mentioned, is cost. I've heard that you can actually run the stock 2AZ ECU in these cars, and actually, if you run a certain amount of boost, you can even do a, a TRD flash tune from the factory. Is that right? Yeah, um, there, there are some caveats with that, though. Um, uh, the way I designed this kit is to use the factory ECU from, say, a Scion TC, and then you can tune it with a piggyback. That way you retain all your OBD2 functions. 
So you can still scan the car as if it's a regular production car that came off the assembly line this way. It helps with diagnosing things and coming up with all your general trouble codes that you can possibly run into. Um, now, as far as the TRD tune, that's good if you don't plan on racing. That, I wouldn't recommend that for racing because that tune was originally meant for the supercharger kit and the way superchargers work is a little bit different than turbos. And on top of that, this platform doesn't natively have a map sensor. So the way TRD tuned that was based off of um, the specific injectors that they would use. So once the car is in open loop, it would just dump that full load of fuel. Mm. Now with this particular build, it builds boost very fast. So, I mean, as long as you use a turbo that's like under 70 millimeters, you can see full boost before three grand under wow. wide open throttle. Wow. So um, generally uh, I usually package these with like a, uh, a 6360 size turbo. Garrett's kind of my favorite. Uh, I used to run a Garrett for a long time for actually 13 years before I gave up. And a buddy of mine actually uh, gave me this Evo turbo and I kind of used that and just made it work. That's fantastic. So it's OEM Evo 10 turbo. It's an OEM Evo Evo 10 turbo, but it has an upgraded uh, impeller wheel. So that's fantastic. And also one more thing. I know people know I'm a Honda guy. People mm -hmm. know case swaps are coming out for almost everything. Sure. And I remember you saying that the uh, the Toyota ECU does have a very low red line. What is a safe red line for this, in your opinion? Um. Okay. The OEM red line is about 63 to 6500. Um. These. Heads are, have been known to take up to like seven grand okay before you actually have to, you know, upgrade the valve train. So once you actually upgrade the valve train to something like Super Tech or, you know, whatever your flavor is as far as um, valve stems and retainers and all that stuff, you can you can redline at about 8,300. That's amazing. That's that's the safe case, uh, territory for the K24 too, if you do a couple of simple mods. But mm -hmm. man, I'm happy. I think it really is a... Uh, a viable mod you can yeah. do the oem ecu and then build as you go I'm right and and the great thing about this too is like uh you have to really get up there in horsepower before you actually start to see a real separation between horsepower and torque so like say a very a bone stock motor with only 10 psi you'll make 300 horsepower about 300 pounds of torque so you're kind of like even there and as you go up higher, like this is probably closer to like 400 420 or whatever yeah so i still got that even number of torque once you get up to around 500, then you start to see the separation to where you're just like maybe 30 pounds of torque less. You know what I mean? Yeah. But other than that, that's a really good balance. Uh, I've talked to people that have the FA20 and they make about 400 and something horsepower, but I still make double their torque. I bet. I think that settles it, buddy. I think mm -hmm. uh, I'm eager for a ride. What do you think? Yeah, right, let's do it. Let's do it, buddy. Thanks. So we made it out of the driveway. Shane's telling us that the heat and AC work even better. I guess they have a smaller uh, AC oh, compressor on the. It's a bigger AC compressor. Oh yeah, yeah, on yeah, the FA so small. It gets really, really cold. Okay. Try to get up this hill pretty good. We're doing good. That factory limited slip does its job. I know plenty of people that are daily. Actually, that green FRS with the the um, stand set up. Yeah. yeah, he dailies that car. Wow. He's driven it all through Canada and other places. Canada is the most trying as far as traction from what I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> and from what he's told me, the car's been absolutely reliable through some pretty, pretty crazy conditions being that, you know, he's running negative seven camber. Jeez. So. that swap to him yet um the green yeah, yeah he's got it oh he does yeah he does have it oh. yeah he, he actually has a jdm motor so uh. some of the parts are a little different for him some stuff he might have the special order you know like water pumps and stuff like that yeah now i know people, a lot of people think that are new to the car community that jdm means better sometimes jdm engines are a little better built sometimes they have more power is there any performance difference for the jdm and the usdm engines no the the main superpower that the jdm engines have is their low mileage because in japan it's not supposed to have a high mileage engine it's true because they their emissions are like crazy okay finally we're on the road Feel the pull of this thing, but 
I'm pretty sure you'll kind of get the gist. I mean, the car is very smooth driving. I mean, you feel how it idles. Not a whole lot of vibration because it actually has some pretty stiff motor mounts in it. Honestly, this just feels like a relatively bolt-on stock car. If I didn't know this mm -hmm. car didn't have this engine as an option, I wouldn't know. Wow, okay. Yeah, I almost spent a lot of time in the passenger seat, so... <laughs> It's like when you're the driver, there's certain things that you don't feel, and the passenger feels more stuff than you typically would. Oh, yeah. But also, you never get a second chance at a first impression, so this is all new for me. You're right, that's true. Oh, man. Yeah, I thought it'd be harsh. I thought it'd be tinny. Like, I've seen a lot of decanted four-cylinders. It, honestly, it's... Obviously, it muffles a good bit of the sound, which is yeah. good. Yeah, so the turbo is kind of like a pseudo resonator in itself, and then I'm running um, a Borla muffler in line with a um, vibrant, the uh, what was that, the super quieter? I forget what it's called. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm running that vibrant resonator, and that's what's giving me the resonance that you hear right now. Now, before this, I used to have a Scion TC, and that exhaust combination was. Uh, Borla axle back with a pseudo mid pipe, which has been long discontinued. But that combination, it, it's a very unique sound. It almost makes the car sound like a SUV. <laughs> So 
pistons will crack just from that. But when it comes to general abuse, for some reason they kind of hold up pretty well. So my main takeaway is as long as you don't overheat your engine for an excessively long period of time, the 2AZ is pretty strong. Even in stock form, it's amazing. Are there any other platforms you're considering working with? Is there any other engine at all you consider putting in this car, or do you think this is your uh, main cup of tea here for a while? Well, um, I had some ideas on some stuff, but it's too early to tell which way I'm going to go. Because uh, a lot of people ask me about you know running a beams motor, but it's like, how often do you come across those? True. Um, and then there's the uh, new motor that's in the uh, Corolla GR. Oh, that yeah. would be very interesting. Somebody already sent me a listing from Copar, but someone wrecked their GR already. Wow. And uh, but there's no price on the listing, and he's telling me I should just jump on it and buy it for the motor. But uh, I'm still doing my research because I, where the GR sits is a factory 300 horsepower, which is pretty good. There's still more I need to learn about it before I even consider even messing with that because I'm pretty sure. Um, swap like that would cost so much that you might as well just buy the car because it's so new you know what I mean for sure but there are shops out there already playing around with the GR because there will be a market for it but uh there's not that many of those cars available to the general public right now yeah that's one thing I actually dislike is uh I mean, obviously, if you're passionate about a build, go for it. But a lot of people, they put so much money into a build, and it's like, brother, you could have this car stock with, you know, a turbo or supercharger kit and a C7 vet for that kind of money. Right. So, for me, I, I, obviously, there's multiple stages to this swap, but mm -hmm. I like the idea that the overall cost is still, I mean, you could do this swap for well under the price of a slightly used newer BRZ, right? A GT86. Oh, absolutely. GT86. I mean, I think... You know, doing this swap almost pays for itself in a, a bit. Because, alright, this is going to be a little tricky. There we go. Some of these robes are ridiculous. They got like a wide middle center section and then these narrow side streets. What's a uh, good condition low mileage uh, FA20 worth because that also can help pay for the swap if you didn't blow the engine, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, from what I've seen, a low mileage FA20 on uh, most places run between five and six grand. Wow. So um, that's kind of what the Metro Detroit did with uh, his green off RS when he did the swap. Mm. Uh, I took the motor and we sold it and then uh, most of that money paid for the majority of his swap. And then there was very lift, little left over to come out of pocket with for him. So that's just fantastic. Gotta get a shot of the interior here. Cages. It's all just put together well, man. I mean, the, uh, the stock seats, no. No, these are not stock seats. These are just some bucket seats I picked up off of eBay, and you know they do pretty well. But they fit the general aesthetic, the red stitching, red stitching, you know. Yeah, I try to make everything match pretty good. Uh, as far as the gauges go, that's my fuel pressure because I'm actually running a fuel return kit in this car. Um, just something. It's not necessary with the swap, but that's just something extra I did because I was doing a lot of R&D. Um, down here is the scan gauge too. With that, I can actually scan for check engine codes and delete them on the fly. And also, this sees every uh, diagnostic that the ECU actually sees. Everything from long and short term, fuel, fuel trim, voltage, water temperature, open and closed loop, and 
that's similar to this type of gauge as far as the information it displays. But yeah, we can definitely talk about that a little later. Absolutely. Wide angle mirror, I like that. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the vital in every car. Did that in every car I've ever owned? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I had to get one of those as soon as I saw. I, I was actually in O'Reilly's and I randomly saw it. And you know, I thought it'd be a great upgrade because the factory mirror in this car is so small. that red light down there uh, and, uh, under the steering column oh under the all in the footwell yes that's just mood lighting just saw oh. a red led you got it too see didn't even notice it wow look at that it looks cool i mean i like Thank it you. so uh i know this car might not exactly be a zero to 60 car i heard the boost flutter like you said it gets boost quick what's rough zero to 60 time on this hmm. uh i guess it depends on what tire you're running really <laughs> good point so, last time I checked, with all season tires, brake and traction and everything, uh, it's about five seconds. Awesome. Uh, right now I'm actually running uh, Falcon 615K plus track tires. So, in good weather conditions, it could probably be a lot quicker than that, but I could still do a rolling burnout even in these tires. <laughs> yeah, well, I believe it. So, I mean, yeah, you saw, you saw the car just kind of twisted just from pulling from fifth gear it felt solid but it felt like something was just popping up under me i just shot up for a second must have hit a, hit a bump of ice but i definitely felt it you're right yeah this, this car makes a ridiculous amount of torque and a lot of people ask me it's like don't you want more power and it's like you know a lot of horsepower is mostly for bragging rights but if you can't plant it to the ground and actually use it it's useless you know what i mean it's very good point you gotta be able to actually move forward and it's not it, for me personally it's not fun if i you know go to launch a car and i'm sitting in the same spot just lighting up the tires you know i gotta be able to move forward and feel the car perform oh that's another thing the balance of this thing actually improved a little bit oh so, really from left to right it's almost a, a straight like 50 50 balance the front the balance from front to rear is about the same as stock the weight difference, almost, uh, the weight's almost exact same? Yeah, well, it's the weight balance. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, so, um, because the FA20 is a 400 pound motor, whereas the 2 wow. is 240 pounds. But then you start to add more weight once you, you know, add the turbo kit and the manifold and all that other stuff. So, but it's still, I would have to say, it's still under, um, definitely under 400 pounds by the time it's all said and done. That's fantastic. Last, last time I corner balanced, or I'm sorry, corner weighted the car, it came to a total of 2,800 pounds. So that's still kind of the same as stock for the most part. Yeah, my thing is, yeah, I hear it. Full tank of gas and all the fluids and everything. That's amazing. 28, that, that's definitely less than uh, any other coupe I can think of on the market. That, the only other competitor at that weight would be the Miata, I would think. The Miata? Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, not, not in power, but it would be... The only thing no, I'm just thinking about weight because that's a really small car. Oh, you're talking about the newer Miata? Yeah. Oh, okay. My, my brain just went to the older one. <laughs> no worries. Because <laughs> that's the thing, man. I mean, there's not a whole lot of competitors. Just like the old uh, mm -hmm. AMC, was it the AMX? It was actually a two-seater. Oh, yeah. yeah. so, so that was technically a Corvette competitor. Yeah. But I mean, what, what, what was this compared to? I mean, the Mustang, maybe, and then... I guess maybe a Miata is not much really to compare it to anymore, unfortunately, for us enthusiasts. Yeah, now, I've, I've driven Mustangs before. I've been in a lot of fast Mustangs. One thing I can say is the way this thing launches, because, like, the uh, tire aspect ratio makes a big difference, too, mm -hmm. when, when how a car performs. When I launch this thing, it lurches like a Mustang does. It just kind of squats in the back, and you feel feels like it wants to just kind of, like, gallop. Yeah, oh yeah. When it, when it really bites traction. So the way I have this car set up, it, it's, I wanted it set up to where it can do more than just one type of uh, motorsport. So it can do straight line racing and it can do road racing. Drifting, it can do that, but it, it's a different animal. Like, like you, you just felt how easy it just kicks to the side if you really get into it. Oh yeah. So, with that being said, I just worried about, you know, how easily will I just start breaking stuff because it's a lot of torque. Well, I mean, 
I've seen the with Jackson Racing, the supercharger kit for the uh, FA20 is becoming popular. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like you said, you have double that torque and at roughly the same boost, roughly mm -hmm. the same horsepower. It's just not a torquey engine at all, the FA20. Yeah, I mean, the FA20, I, I mean, I can't knock it totally because the way they designed it, it sounds amazing. It's smooth revving. Um, and the power delivery is just right for the weight of the car. So when they built everything, they kind of built it to the maximum. But all the value of the vehicle is in the engine because the FA20, brand new from the dealership, is like $27,000. Yeah, a brand new long block. The long block's twenty seven grand. Yeah. Oh my god. Last time I checked. I believe it. Now, a brand new short block from the dealer, the two AC, thirty five hundred. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like if you if you want like a fresh new OEM motor, just go to the dealer, give them the part number, and boom, there you go. You don't have to think about it. Just break it in like norm, like you normally would any fresh motor and then you know you can enjoy it 10 psi 300 horsepower you can i mean my estimate is you can enjoy that worry free for five years but it i say that because you don't know what people have in, in as far as their intentions with a build you know, right some people will build something beat on it and then think that it's just going to last forever and then there are some people that are very gentle with their car so they might get away with 15 years you know what i mean mm-hmm so it really depends on what is the purpose for the vehicle. Now that's the thing. I mean, if you really are married to the FA20, you can get a, a nice low mileage used, mm -hmm. probably a FRS because it's cheaper because Scion's a dead name brand. And then mm -hmm. you could buy another shell and then 2AZ swap it and still be at less than a new long walk, long walk price. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And, and I, I, what I like about this kit too is like the way I design it, if you wanted to go back to stock, you could. That's amazing. Like, like, if you said, hey, I had my fun, I want to move on to some other type of car, I want to sell this one, but obviously, you know, no one's going to know what in the world I'm selling, so i got to <laughs> yeah. put a factory FA20 in it. Put the motor in there, plug everything back up the way it was, send it on down the road. That's amazing. And then, and then you can, like, sell your built 2AZ to the next person that's interested, you know? Mm -hmm. How is interest doing these days? How many have you sold these kits? Uh, I sold about five. For now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because, like, this, this is almost like a one-man show. You know, I, I got a guy in California who's actually doing all my CAN bus programming. Because uh, that's where the real magic happens. The CAN bus bridge makes it so everything is integrated. Like, you see how the dash works flawlessly. It does. No check engine lights. Nothing weird like that. No trouble codes. Power steering works, AC works, everything works, uh, including, you know, these buttons here, you know. Oh, wow. Sport mode, traction, all that stuff works. You can still do the pedal dance like normal. I mean, not that you would notice anything because you're making so much more power. <laughs> it's true. Okay, we're back in the subdivision. Uh, I'm going to really test my driving skill here. And I will do my best not to distract you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm used to. So far, so good. So far, so good. They did a good job paving the street. Yeah, I guess so. It was amazing.